Is the new M1 Pro MacBook Pro with 16 GPU cores powerful enough, or is upgrading to the M1 Max MacBook Pro with 32 GPU cores necessary to get the high speed performance you desire? Today, I'll be comparing these chips in the 16 inch MacBook Pros and testing them specifically for video editing, putting them through more real world tests than is probably necessary. And not a single test is a benchmark. I'll be doing a ton of playback, scrubbing, and render tests using multiple video codecs and frame rates, expert tests, tests with simple timelines, as well as complicated timelines loaded with tons of effects, then finishing off with stabilization, color grade, transcode tests, and once these are all done, there is no way you won't be able to make an informed decision on which computer is right for you. Quick side note before we begin, here are the full specs for each Mac. The differences are that the Max has double the GPU cores, RAM, SSD storage, and costs 1000 US dollars more. Jumping right into the first batch of tests, playback quality in a 4K timeline with 4K footage. These are simple timelines with no added effects. Both MacBook Pros have no issues playing back this H.265 video in 24 frames per second, 60, and 120 FPS with zero drop frames. Unsurprisingly, they also have no problems playing back this H.264 in 24, 60, and 120 FPS. And the least compressed codec all intra, all frame rates play smoothly. Next is scrubbing performance with the same codecs and frame rates. H.265 at 24 FPS scrubs really good on both Macs with no obvious differences between the two. 60 FPS is slightly worse than 24. Lastly, 120 FPS looks as good as 60 FPS on both Macs, which is surprising, as this was not the case on the other Macs I tested. H.264 scrubs the same on both Macs as H.265, with 24 FPS looking smoother than 60 and 120 FPS. All intra plays completely buttery smooth on both MacBook Pros with seemingly no drop frames in scrubbing for all the frame rates. Next test is working in a real project that's loaded with tons of effects. The A-roll is an easier to process codec. H.265, 420, 4K, 24 FPS, and 50 megabits per second. First test in this project is simply rendering the A-roll timeline with all native and third-party effects disabled. This project is 18 minutes and 15 seconds long. The M1 Max MacBook Pro is able to complete the render on a 4K timeline in 2 minutes and 42 seconds, or 2.7 minutes. And the M1 Pro was 4 seconds faster at 2.63 minutes. On a 1080 timeline, the same A-roll render was 1.32 minutes on the M1 Max, and 1.35 minutes on the M1 Pro, so basically the same for both Macs. Next is the big one, render and export of the entire project with all effects enabled. The M1 Max completed the render with a 4K timeline in 21.82 minutes, and the M1 Pro was 22.93 minutes. Exporting the rendered project took the M1 Max 52.85 minutes, with the M1 Pro only 11 seconds slower, at 53.03 minutes. On a 1080 timeline, things were quite a bit faster for both Macs. The M1 Max rendered the full project in 13.02 minutes, and the M1 Pro was 13.85 minutes. The M1 Max exported the entire project in 29.15 minutes, while the M1 Pro was 32.02 minutes. Although the M1 Pro was slower, I do want to mention that I repeated these render and export tests on this jam-packed project a few times on both Macs, and got significant variation in times even though I didn't change a single thing for each test. Here are all the times I got for each test on each Mac, which you can see varied by several minutes in some cases. I have no idea why this was happening, but I think if I were to generalize these results, both the M1 Max and the M1 Pro are basically performing the same. While the absolute fastest times are going to the M1 Max, it's only a slight margin. In addition, at times, it was a few minutes slower than the M1 Pro in some repeated tests. Export and render tests are a good metric to gauge performance, but I wanted to see how good playback performance is in this massive project when nothing is rendered. Basically what it would be like when you are actively editing. This is still a 4K timeline with better quality playback on and going from a 6 to a 10 effects stack. Starting from 1.16.10, the M1 Max plays until 1.22.01 before it drops frames, while the M1 Pro drops at 1.21.12, so only half a second shorter. Switching the timeline to better performance though, both MacBook Pros can play through the effects stack without dropping any frames. Better performance mode reduces the image quality of the source video to I believe 25%. The next effect stack is even heftier, going from 1 effect to 17 in quality playback. Starting at 10.51.10, the M1 Max drops frames at 11.01.21, 1, 
while the M1 Pro drops a few seconds earlier at 10.56.16. Once again switching to performance playback though, both MacBook Pros can play through the entire 17 FX stack without dropping any frames. Of course, when you are editing a video and have auto render on, sections of your video will begin to render. So I wanted to find out how playback would be in a 4K timeline with better quality when the section is rendered. Both the MacBook Pros played with no drop frames in the first and second example. I switched the timeline to 1080 to see if that would boost performance. The M1 Max in the first example played for half a second longer and stopped at 122.13, and also for a second half longer in the second example dropping at 11.02.07. The M1 Pro got a solid two second boost in the first example, extending to 123.04, and a six second boost in the second example to 11.02.11. So the M1 Max performed better for a 4K timeline, but the M1 Pro was better than the M1 Max in a 1080 timeline. The final test I wanted to do in this complicated project is the time it takes to render just one effect in the 17 stack. I know when I'm creating these videos and I just want to do something simple, like change the duration of an effect, it's a pain when it takes forever to render that one tiny change. The way this test works is I render the entire 17 stack, then I extend just one effect by 14 20 seconds, and I start the timer when I re-render the effect stack. In a 4K timeline, the M1 Max took 4.62 minutes, while the M1 Pro was 2.02 minutes. Yes, the M1 Pro was over two times faster. Reducing the effect stack to a more reasonable 7 stack, the M1 Max took 3.58 minutes to render, while the M1 Pro was faster again at 1.48 minutes. Unfortunately, I returned the M1 Max prior to seeing the M1 Pro results, but I believe this was another situation of variable performance that we saw earlier. I think if I had restarted the M1 Max and redid the test, I would have gotten the same results as the M1 Pro. To back that theory up, when I redid this render test on a 1080 timeline, I got the exact same times for both Macs, for a 17 stack, rendering in 1.78 minutes, and the same one for the 7 effect stack, both Macs rendered in 1.23 minutes. Next test is going back to those codec and frame rate example shots, this time with some render and export tests. For the 24 FPS 5 min talking head clip, I applied 120x magnification, as without it there would be nothing to render. All these tests will be in a 4K timeline with the exception of just one 1080 timeline test to compare at the end. I would first time the export of the unrendered 24 FPS project, then time the rendering, and finally time exporting the project once again once it had been rendered. For the 1 minute 60 and 120 FPS clips, I would slow down the footage to 40 and 20% respectively, and time how long it took to render the slow motion, then time the export. H265, 5 minutes, 24p, the unrendered export was 5.67 minutes on the M1 Max, and 5.5 minutes on the M1 Pro. Rendering the timeline was blazing fast for both Macs, 41 seconds for the M1 Max, and 43 seconds for the M1 Pro. Exporting the rendered clip had basically no improvement, 5.63 minutes for the M1 Max, and 5.47 minutes for the M1 Pro. H.265 60fps slowed to 40% was a 22 second render for both the M1 Max and the M1 Pro, and the M1 Max exported the 60fps rendered clip in 2.97 minutes and the M1 Pro in 2.88 minutes. Lastly for H.265 120fps slowed to 20%, the render time for the M1 Max was 40 seconds and 43 seconds for the M1 Pro. Export time for the 120fps clip was 5.88 minutes for the M1 Max and 5.72 minutes on the M1 Pro. Here are the rest of the times for the other codecs and frame rates. A general theme is that the M1 Pro almost always exported 10 seconds faster than the M1 Max, while the M1 Max almost always rendered 2 seconds faster than the M1 Pro. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to do just one test in a 1080 timeline to see how much faster things were compared to a 4K timeline. I used the same H.265 24fps 5 min clip and did the same round of tests. The M1 Max completed the unrendered export in 1.57 minutes, while the M1 Pro took 1.5 minutes. Rendering the 120x magnification was 33 seconds for the M1 Max and 32 seconds for the M1 Pro. And lastly, exporting the render timeline was 1.55 minutes on the M1 Max and 1.5 minutes on the M1 Pro. Not looking super great for the M1 Max so far, I have to say. Moving on to stabilization, using the same 60 and 120 FPS clips from earlier. For these tests, I turned on auto render so as soon as the stabilization transcode was complete, it would start rendering the stabilization immediately. I kept the clips at full speed though so there's no rendering power being used for slow motion. For H.265 60fps, the M1 Max took 1.2 minutes to stabilize and the M1 Pro took 1.18 minutes to stabilize. 
For the 120 FPS stabilized clip, the M1 Pro was once again one second faster coming in at 1.98 minutes compared to two minutes on the M1 Max. The stabilization and renders were very similar for the other codecs. The M1 Pro was faster than the M1 Max for H.264 being 11 and 8 seconds faster for 60 and 120 FPS. And for all intra, the M1 Max was 2 seconds faster for 60 FPS, while both Max had the same time for 120 FPS. I want to say that the Max are basically performing the same, but the M1 Pro keeps being the tiniest sliver faster than the M1 Max again and again somehow. Next test is fun. It's another FX test to see how many I can stack before we drop frames, but in a much more controlled scenario. This one will have effects starting at evenly spaced intervals to see how big the stack can go. I used a simple line animation from a third party plugin that I stacked every five seconds. For a 4K unrendered timeline and quality playback, the M1 Max could handle 20 lines before drop frames, while the M1 Pro could only handle 16. Changing to performance playback, the M1 Max could handle the entire 60 line stack without dropping frames, while the M1 Pro dropped at 50 lines. Changing the timeline to 1080 and quality playback, the M1 Max got to 58 lines and the M1 Pro got to 44 lines. Both the M1 Max and the MacBook Pro could handle the whole 60 line stack in 1080 and performance playback. Next test is another full project, but this time a much simpler one with mainly native text effects and much smaller stacks. The A-roll is the same easy codec as before, H.265 but now it's double the bitrate and 100 megabits per second. Rendering just the 4K timeline, which is 9.28 minutes with no effects active, took the M1 Max 1.32 minutes and the M1 Pro 1.38 minutes. Rendering the entire project with all effects active took the M1 Max 1.93 minutes and the M1 Pro 2.1 minutes. You can see how much faster things can render with minimal native effects versus the extremely large effect stacks plus third-party plugins that I was testing earlier. Finally, exporting the full project took the M1 Max quite a bit longer than the renders at 10.47 minutes, and the M1 Pro came in a bit faster at 10.13 minutes. I repeated the tests on a 1080 timeline, and here are the results. Both MacBook Pros had blazing fast renders, and the export was significantly faster. And although the M1 Max was four seconds faster than the M1 Pro in the whole render project, and the M1 Pro was four seconds faster in the export than the M1 Max, I'd say they are basically performing the same. Quite a common theme throughout this video. All right, on to our second last test, color grading. I took the five minute H.265 clip from earlier and I stacked 15 adjustment layers with Final Cut Pro native color adjustments. Both the M1 Max and the M1 Pro MacBook Pros are able to get to the top of the effect stack with zero drop frames. The second half of the color grade test is just rendering the entire five minute clip with a less intense color adjustment, but still pushing the global, shadows, highlights, and midtones, as well as temperature and hue, and adding some adjustments in color finale as well as the LUT. So quite a few things. The M1 Max finally was able to get a little bit of a concrete win, finishing the render in 1.62 minutes, while the M1 Pro took 2.23 minutes. Last and final test, transcoding to optimize in proxy media in a few scenarios. For the first part of this test, once again, I used those various codec and frame rates from earlier. I wanted to see how long it took to transcode all three frame rates for each codec. For H.265, transcoding 24, 60, and 120 FPS to optimize took the M1 Max 1.28 minutes and the M1 Pro 1.38 minutes. Transcoding proxy 50% took the M1 Max 42 seconds and the M1 Pro 48 seconds. As you can see for H.264 and the all intra codecs, the Max performed basically the same with the M1 Max beating the M1 Pro in every test. However, the M1 Max was mostly only two to eight seconds faster on average. These results are great, but I don't think they tell the whole story. I wanted to see how fast transcode times were when under longer sustained loads. To test this, I transcoded a freelance project I did. It consists of 13 minutes of footage over 56 clips, mostly on 120 FPS with some 60 FPS. All shot in H.265, 4K, and the highest bitrate possible being 150 and 200 megabits per second. Once again, the M1 Max takes a small victory transcoding the project to optimize in 5.47 minutes and proxy in 3.05 minutes. The M1 Pro was a little bit slower completing optimized in 6.43 minutes and proxy in 3.7 minutes. And finally, for the last test, I transcoded a talking head clip that's just like this. The clip is H.265, 420, 4K, 24P, and 35 minutes long. The M1 Max transcoded optimized in 3.1 minutes and proxy in 1.82 minutes. The M1 Pro did optimized in 3.72 minutes and proxy in 2.17 minutes. So all transcodes were slower for the M1 Max for sure, but $1,000 slower, 
Not really. So what do all these tests tell us about these Macs? I honestly thought the M1 Max MacBook Pro would smoke every single Mac in this comparison series, and that just hasn't been the case. The M1 Pro MacBook Pro performs so well against the M1 Max in so many tests. I know there's a lot of different workflows out there, but there's no way this video didn't include at least a few things that you do in Final Cut Pro when editing a video. And as you saw, the M1 Pro did extremely well when compared to the M1 Max. If you don't believe me, just go back and look, because I know a lot of you are just skipping to this conclusion. But I will say this, if you use Final Cut Pro like I do, which I think is pretty standard, there's no reason to spend more for the M1 Max. The M1 Pro MacBook Pro will do really well for you. If you're interested in seeing how other Macs performed, I've tested the original M1 MacBook Pro and a fully specced out 2020 Intel iMac. And once I complete this video editing series, I'll complete a more holistic comparison between all four Macs, testing their performance in photo editing, as well as other general tests. If you have any questions, let me know down below. And if not, thank you very much for stopping by, and I hope you have a fantastic day. Take care.